Good afternoon, everybody. This is Lisa Roberts with the Florida Wildfire Foundation. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation. So we are the Florida Wildfire Foundation, and uh, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildfire habitats through education, research, planting, and conservation. You can find out more about us at flawildflowers.org. This is brought to you by the State Wildflower License Plate, and whether you have this old look or new, you are funding research, education, and planting projects statewide with your $15 fee that's paid to us with the uh, uh, purchase or um, renewal of this license plate. First, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, all attendees will be muted uh, with their cameras off throughout the webinar. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so it will be available on youtube.com slash FLA wildflowers and FLA wildflowers.org in about uh, 24 hours. Uh, questions may be submitted uh, during the webinar through the Q&A feature at any point, and we will be answering those at the end of the presentation if, as time permits. We usually leave about 15 minutes. So if your question is not answered, you can email it to us at info at flawildflowers.org, and we will be sure to get it to Terry. And speaking of Terry, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Um, wildflower form farming in Florida, and there are very few people uh, in Florida that know more about the subject than Terry Zinn. Terry has represented the Florida Wildflower Seed and Plant Growers Association on the foundation's board since 2007, and he's practiced environmental law since 1984 and holds a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's degree in wildlife ecology. Before entering law, he was a biologist in government and private consulting firms, and he served as the senior attorney for the Florida Department of Transportation's District 2 from 1992 to 2007. He also spent 10 years on the Executive Council of Environmental and Land Use Law section of the Florida Bar Association. In 2003, he became a founding member of the Florida Wildflower Seed and Plant Growers Association, Wildflower of Florida's Incorporated is his Alachua farm, and he produces 17 species of native wildflower seed. So Terry, um, I'm going to um, let you start sharing and um, I will let you take over. All right, now you should see my screen for the, wild, uh, the um, PowerPoint, and I'm gonna start from beginning. And let me know if you see the first slide, you do? Yep. We see you. All right, good. All right, great. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm gonna be talking about growing wildflowers in Florida for seed. And as you can see here uh, in the background here is Helianthus and Gustafolius, the narrow leaf sunflower. Um, and uh, I also am a member of the Florida Wildflower Co-op, which is a cooperative of growers who collectively have uh, grow wildflower seed. And we have a common website because it obviously doesn't make sense for every farmer to have a website and to deal with that. So um, I'm gonna take you initially through a number of species that I grow and talk about why we do what we do with them. Um, this is uh, sand squares you see in the first slide. Uh, it's a low growing xeric species and you see they're being grown on fabric. We use fabric for a number of reasons. Um, most farmers try to avoid labor costs as much as possible because typically labor is your most expensive part of farming. And in this case, uh, we also do it for a couple other reasons. One, uh, it ex excludes weeds, which means I don't have to use herbicides or spend a lot of time weeding. And it also uh, allows the plants to get water because that fabric is actually woven and allows water to penetrate. So it also provides additional water to the plants. And should also move back up. Also, um, many of the species drop their seed over a period of time. And so we use the fabric to allow us to collect the seed in a fairly clean state so that we can harvest it and then prepare it. And we'll talk about that later about the processes we go through. Some species we don't need to grow on fabric. This is yellow top, Flavaria linearis. Um, it, is, it retains its seed very tightly in a cup for quite a long period of time. So it allows us to actually uh, let the seed stay for a while and collect it at a more convenient time. 
This one you can either harvest with a machine or you can hand harvest. In our case, we have a fairly small patch, so we hand harvest. And, and it, it only takes a few hours to harvest the patch because you can see the flowers are quite dense, as will be the seeds. Green eyes, uh, Berlandaria subcalis. Uh, it's a perennial. Um, we grow it on fabric uh, because uh, it excludes weeds. Also, the seeds are fairly light and they fall out of the plant and allows us to collect the seeds. We both hand harvest these off the plant and off the, off the fabric as well. Uh, any of the Liatris, this is Liatris uh, gracilis, the gay feather. This is actually in its habitat in Osceola National Forest where I got was allowed to collect seed. Um, it produces a spike and the seeds stay on the spike for quite a while. So we can basically let these stay on the spike and then we break the spike off and we will process the seeds through some machinery I'll show you later in the presentation. Uh, buffalo clover is our only native clover in Florida. It grows mostly north of Ocala, so you won't see it in uh, Orlando or South Florida. And we grow it on a fabric, again, to exclude uh, weeds and water, but also it drops its seed in its little ball bearings. And if it were to drop into the sand, it would be very hard to collect. Um, we also collect it off the plant as well, too. And I'll show you some pictures of some of the seeds so you get a si idea of what size we're talking about. Uh, Coreopsis lanceolata, uh, we also grow on fabric again to exclude weeds and to allow water. And you can see a roll of the fabric where my arrow is pointing here that's getting ready to be laid out in an area. And uh, we do not uh, treat the soil very much. Typically, we will uh, mow it very closely and roll the fabric out. And I'll show you another picture of that later. In case of lanceolata, we harvest off the seed, off the seed heads themselves. But a lot of these seeds actually drop over a long period of time. And so we are going into those areas with fabric and sweeping up the seed every couple of weeks as they, they drop out or are available on the fabric. Standing cypress, these two pictures are actually taken in their habitat of longleaf pine turkey oak, where they normally reside. And in the background, the yellow is Rebecca mollus, and I'll show you that shortly. Uh, standing cypress forms little capsules, and you can see some in the right picture where my arrow is moving. Uh, they hold their seed quite a while. And like the Liatris, we can let these stand for a while and then come along and pick the seed heads off once they're all the seed are ripe and process them later. And again, they're fairly easy to harvest. And the next slide you can see is a row of the standing cypress growing. It looks like dog fennel to many people, and many people ex ex uh, mistake it for such. To the left of it is actually the buffalo clover after it has lost most of its vegetation. Uh, Coreopsis of Unworthii is another one we grow on fabric, and this one drops its seed over a six to eight week period. Uh, for example, if you were to try to harvest this with a machine in a field when it, after it was bloomed, you might only get 5% of the seed that we will get off of by harvesting on fabric over a six to eight week period. And what we will do is collect it on a couple weeks period, and then at the end, after everything's done, we'll go in and sweep up around the base of the plant and vacuum it off and I'll show you talk about some of the tools we use later. Uh, stand, uh, giant ironweed, one of the best butterfly attractors that we have and it truly gets giant. It can get up to eight feet, ten feet tall. Uh, its seed is windborne and I can show you this next slide is a picture of right before the seeds getting ready to go loose and what we do is to let it develop to this high this stage and then we come in and clip the seed heads off and we then store them in a very dry environment and the seed head, seeds will fall out by a little bit of manipulation. And in case you're wondering, these obviously are not eight feet high. A lot of the wildflowers, as long as you prune them early in the stage of growth before the flower buds form, you can regulate the height of your flowers if you don't want them to get very tall. Obviously, I don't want to be standing on a ladder in a field trying to harvest these things, so we try to keep them in the, in the three to four foot range. Again, Liatris spiccato on the right, uh, Chapman eye on the left, uh, fairly easy to harvest, uh, again, because they have these nice vertical stalks, uh, easy to break off and collect the seed. Uh, powder puff mimosa. This one is a low grower. It grows in our production area, which you see to the right, and then to the left is a close-up of the picture. And this forms a pod, and it makes a little bean. The pod has two to four, two to ten seeds, ten if you're lucky, two if you're not so lucky. And you can see that the flowers here are kind of growing in waves on the right-hand photo. If everything comes in at the right time and, and it 
basically matures at the same time, we can bring a combine in, and I'll describe what that is later, but a machine and harvest this all at once. And we can harvest this field, which is about an acre, in about two to three hours with a combine. If I have to hand harvest it because it came in at uneven patches, which it did last year, for example, it will take two to three weeks of manual labor of hand harvesting the seed pods uh, because you can't use machine because you'll harvest a lot of the green pods and you'll damage them in the process. Black-eyed Susans, Rebecca Herta, uh, all of our Rebeccas hold their seed a long time in the seed heads, uh, so we can relax and take time to harvest these seed heads. Uh, we harvest it by machine in large patches. We also grow some in fabric areas um, and, and harvest it by hand. Um, it's easier to get clean seed when you harvest by hand. Machine harvesting requires more cleaning because you're picking not only the flower heads of this species, but also weeds that may be in, in the patch as well. Uh, this is a related uh, Rebecca mollus, a soft can cone flower, a soft hair cone flower, and it's the one I showed you in the background of the standing cypress. It's a xeric species. It performs a bush, and again, it has these really nice dense seed heads that hold the seed for a long period of time. Uh, purple lovegrass, we do grow lovegrasses, uh, purple and elliots. We also grow um, some drop seed, and interesting thing about bunch grasses in Florida and all of our native grasses are pretty much bunch grasses is they do not like they do not produce well without fire and of course one of the things you have to understand about wildflower production is I have no book to go look to I have no manual to grow wildflowers so every species we grow we have to figure out does it like fabric does it not want to be on fabric does it need irrigation does it like fertilization not fertilization fortunately most native species don't like a lot of fertilizer. They do need a little potassium, particularly if you harvest seeds all the time. Terry, we lost your audio. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. I, for it, I, the phone line dropped the call, so I apologize uh -huh. about that. I do not. I, I do not have very good Wi-Fi, as Lisa knows. So. Um, so let's see if I still have the screen up on current slide. So are we on the lovegrass slide there, Lisa? Yes. Okay, so so one of the things we learned about the, uh, lovegrasses is that they need to be burned. And obviously if you grow them on fabric, that's an expensive process of putting fabric in every year. So um, many, all of our grasses now we grow without fabric and we actually burn them in the growing season. And to give you an idea of the difference, um, in our first year of production of the lovegrass, we would get like 30 pounds. The next year we got less than a pound because we didn't burn it. And after we burned it this last year, for example, we got 12 pounds off of our uh, one acre patch. So it makes a huge difference in terms of um, knowing the ecology of the species that you're growing. The next one up is our beach sunflower. Uh, this one we grow used to grow on fabric. It turns out we don't have to. Uh, they like it hot. Of course, black fabric is even hotter than the beach. Uh, but one of the reasons we didn't is that uh, we can't, even though the seed drops over the entire summer, uh, we actually have to harvest the seed heads after the petals are off and the seed is ripe, because if the seed gets on the ground, uh, it's a sunflower, and the mice and the birds and the ants and everybody else has got it cleaned up in the morning before I can get out to it. So we actually harvest the whole seed head and process it uh, on this plant. And again, that's just trying to figure out the ecology of the plant and the pests and predators that you have to deal with in farming. Uh, goldenrods are another species, several species we grow. Uh, they hold their seed really well. Um, basically, we can cut the seed heads off when the seeds ripe and bring it in and manipulate it to knock the seed loose. Uh, weather is an issue, uh, as in all farming. Uh, in the upper left is a 700 foot row of Coriops, excuse me, Rebeccia mollus, uh, soft hair coneflower. And in, on the right, bottom right, is that same row after a hailstorm, which basically wiped out the flowers and petals and everything you can see on the ground. Doesn't happen very often, but that's part of farming. Uh, you are at the vagaries of weather. And uh, in the fall, if we get a hurricane early, all that, stand, all that giant ironweed seed you saw standing there ready for me to harvest gets distributed to my neighbors, which has happened a couple times. Uh, fabric installation. Uh, this is when we tried the fabric with our um, uh, purple lovegrass. Uh, it cost about $5,000 an acre to 
put in fabric and temporary irrigation. And that's what you see. There's about an acre and a half there in that picture. There's various width rows, depending on the plants you grow. You, we put some six foot wide in, some three foot and some four foot wide, depending on the plants we're working with. Uh, talking about seed now. So this is buffalo clover seed and the ruler at the bottom uh, is in millimeters. So you can see these seeds are about one millimeter in size, pretty small. They're round, uh, it's a legume, it's a bean essentially. Uh, but to give you an idea in the variety of size of seed that we have to deal with, in my upper right corner is Mimosa strigulosa, and there's about 45,000 seeds in a pound. If you go to the one to the bottom of it, this is yellow-eyed grass, or it's not a grass, it's really a lily. Um, that is about 5 million or more seeds to a pound. You see they're almost like dust. Uh, Rebecca herta is at the bottom of the screen. There's about a million and a half seeds to a pound of that. And it's a true sunflower-like seed, a little needle. And in the upper left is Gallardia pacella, the, uh, which we now don't think is, is native to Florida, uh, but it's very common throughout the state. Um, and it actually has the seed inside this little cone-shaped device. And the reason it has hairs on it is that when the wind blows, the seed will actually drill itself into the ground. It'll bury itself as the wind blows. So it makes a difference, obviously, how you clean these seeds, because there's huge difference between this. You don't want to sneeze when you're around this one. Um, this one's a bean, pretty big. And at the bottom of the screen, you see this is the formula you would use if you wanted to know how much seed you needed to plant an area. So you want to know the number of plants per square foot, say one per square foot. You want to know how many square feet you have. Say it was an acre, it'd be 43,560. And then you want to apply that against your germination rate in seeds per pound. So um, you would just basically do that math formula. And we'll talk about testing seed and how that germination rate works on this. But this would tell you how many seeds you would want to buy. And then knowing how many seeds you want to buy, we can tell you the seed count per, per pound. And then you figure out whether I need an ounce, a pound, a few packets. Uh, some seed harvesting methods. We do hand harvesting, which I've mentioned, uh, labor intensive. We also sweep up off of fabric, which means you only do it episodically, maybe once a week, every two weeks. Some cases, once every six weeks if the seeds are a long time. We also vacuum on fabric. We used to use generators and shop vacs and cords, and, but nowadays they make really nice battery-powered uh, shop vacs that you can just pull along behind you. Uh, we also vacuum them off the plant, and I'll show you a, a machine we created to do that. And we also use a combine to harvest it, like a farmer would combine wheat or corn. So starting off with a handheld combine, this is made in Canada by a company called Prairie Habitats, and they basically just converted a, a uh, steel weed whacker, and they put a little combine on the bottom of it. And basically, this black bar has string coming out of it, and it spins. And when it spins, it creates an air current that puts air and whatever it, those little strings hit into the bag at the bottom, the blue bag. And so you use this to harvest small patches, or in many cases, we'll use this to harvest a natural stand of seed. We've gotten permission to harvest. And it has other cutter heads. The one top here you see with the light blue string is for very, very light seed. And the bottom one is for black-eyed Susans, for example. It's got actually rivets on the ends of the strings, and those are designed to actually cut the seed heads off and dump them in the bag. And you can change those out depending on the species, and you can see the engine for the uh, the power unit there. It's just a steel weed whacker. Um, this unit costs about $1,500 uh, to buy. Uh, sometimes you have to make your own equipment. So this is a little riding lawnmower. <clears throat> and on the back of it is a vacuum. And that vacuum is tied to this shroud. And we use, we harvest Coryopsis Sevenworth eye with this. You can go down the row. And if there is seed in the seed head, it'll be knocked loose and sucked into the vacuum and dumped into a, a cloth bag in the back. And so um, in fact, uh, this has been mechanism been created by many wildflower farmers out in the Midwest, and this is kind of where we copied it from. We also vacuum off the fabric, and it's that same vacuum, except it's tied to a piece of PVC pipe that has a slot in it at the bottom, and there's a bag in front that the blower blows into, and we run this across the plastic, and the vacuum will actually pick the seed up through the slot and dump it into the bag. We also use a combine, and this is a combine harvesting Coryopsis in my big field. And um, we own two of these that are fairly old. One is in 1965 and one in 1975. Um, 
And this requires a species that the seed is all matured at once. You do not want to use this machine on a field where the seed comes into, har into uh, ripeness over a long period of time, because you're going to get very little. For example, if I was to use this to harvest um, Coryopsis 7 worthii, we might only get 5% of the seed that's out there that's any good. Um, whereas if we get it off fabric, uh, we will collect literally 10 to 20 times that much. So how does the combine work? Well, its name is actually derived from what it does. It combines three different devices. There's a sickle bar or cutter bar that cuts the plant, and it gets pushed into a thresher, a cylinder and a beater, and that knocks the seed loose from the seed heads. And that thresher beater and throws it back onto what's called a rattle. It's just a tray with bars on it that carry the material back. And then there's this another beater that beats that material up even further and drops it onto a set of walkers and sit. Um, Terry, we've lost you again. Sorry, folks. Can you hear me now? The phone yes. dropped again. Yes. Now, for some reason, at least I don't know what's going on, but for some reason, the um, the program is kicking me off after a certain amount of time. It says, because huh. I get a, a th thing that comes up and says, you're being disconnected from the audio. So uh, I don't know what's... It yeah. didn't happen yesterday, so I don't know. Yeah, anyway, I don't know. So, so hopefully we'll get towards the end of this. If I can get back on pretty quickly by redialing in, so bear with us here, folks. Anyway, so this is a small combine that we bought. It's called a small farm combine, built in 1965. We bought it in Georgia for scrap value. We had to put about 2,000 hours and between eight and 10,000 dollars of parts in it. Um, to give you an example, a standard combine today, if you bought one new, would cost somewhere in the quarter of a million dollar range, up to a million. Uh, a small farm combine that they use for research would cost you $125,000. So for $10,000, basically, in this, uh, plus our labor, uh, we have a small machine that we can go out and harvest the material. And you see the feed being discharged from the chute here. And that basically what it does is the machine brings the material in, beats it up, and it goes into the back where there's a series of screens and cleans it. So it's combining a, a harvester, a thresher, and a seed cleaner. That's where the name combine comes from. We also have to harvest and process seed through other ways to get them to knock loose. And the uh, we harvest purple lovegrass by hand and then run it through this blower, which dumps it into this large container in the back here. And the reason we do that is that it knocks the seed loose. And the seed on purple lovegrass is about the same size as that yellow-eyed grass I showed you. And basically it knocks the seed loose. And it doesn't hurt the seed because the seed is so light, it has no mass to it, uh, that it can be whacked and knocked loose but not hurt it. Now that's not true for all seeds. Like uh, for example, mimosa, you cannot um, deal with uh, it in a high speed uh, fan like that. And we'll talk about a couple of the missions. In terms of seed drying, for us to work with the seed and clean it, you have to have it down in the 15 to 20% moisture content. Uh, seed we collect off the plastic is pretty dry. Unless collected after a rain or when the dew is still on, we avoid that. And then we store in bags that allow air and moisture to through them, and we store them in a seed room where we have an air conditioner and a dehumidifier running, which keeps the temperature at 75 degrees and the humidity at around 25 to 30 percent. You can also um, dry seed on the concrete, and we've done this. This is the, the garage area we convert during seed processing. We run fans, and in the next slide, you'll see we've gotten advanced more. We run dehumidifiers. We also have a wall-mounted unit that dehumidifies, and so we're running essentially three dehumidifiers. And when the seed comes in, it's about 80% moisture content when we harvest with a combine, for example. And so we have to dry that fairly quickly because the seed can overheat, it can mold and mildew, which will then damage the seed. And so once we, get, it takes about 24 to 48 hours to get it stable. And after that, then we will take the seed down to that five to 10% moisture content range. We also use solar drying, uh, basically a couple tarps uh, pinched together, fans at one end, and an exhaust at the end that's restricted so that it blows up and moves nice, warm, dry air across the seed. Uh, how do we process the seed? We use a number of devices. We use a hammer mill, and I'll show you all these in a few slides, a blower, screen rubbing, we basically rub the material on a screen and the seed will come through and not will rub off the uh, seed coatings. We use a trommel, which is basically a tumbler, uh, a debeerder, which can be anything from a hammer mill to a, a device that scrapes against the seed with a broom. 
And we also use scarifying to, for beans, for example, you have to break the coating on the seed if you want it to germinate. And scarifying can be anything from sandpaper to basically also tumbling it with uh, rocks or seeds or wood blocks or whatever you want to kind of scuff up the seed. So uh, manual screening, basically we made tables which have window screen or a different size screen in them. And we basically hand rub that material through the screen and collect it underneath. And that's what you see this fabric right here will collect stuff that falls through the screen. Uh, we use a um, seed from seed. We use a hammer mill on the left. And this is device, the uh, bar in the center rotates with these, pad with these arms that rotate, but there are also arms on the side that are fixed. And as the material is loaded into this machine and it spins, you can see there's quite a distance between these. So the seed never gets hit very hard. And what this does is it breaks the seed heads up. So we use this on Rebecca, we use it on um, a mimosa, uh, we use it on white indigo, uh, any number of seeds where the head's in a pod and it needs to be broken up. And basically we feed the machine the material. You can see the door opens at the bottom. There's also a side door. And we'll let this run for five to 10 minutes and the material will be broken up and the seed will be at the bottom. And then we can screen it out with the machines I'll show you later. Here's another little blower that we use uh, for smaller quantities. Again, this is uh, devices we've kind of just cobnob from other places. This is a, actually used by woodworkers to collect dust, but we find it, it's great for breaking up seed heads uh, for seed that's very light. We also use a rotary screen, and this is essentially a tumbler. We can put any size screen we want. The, it's three feet wide and 12 feet long, and it spins, and we have a variable speed device on it. And typically what we will do is put seed and trash in here and the screen is sized so that the seed will fall out and the trash will go out the back and you can see that there are paddles in the back of this machine and as it rotates it scoops up the trash and dumps it out that hole in the back but we also can use it in the reverse sense in that if the trash is very small and the seed is big then we can use the screen to allow the trash to fall through and the seed to come out the back and this machine can be used from anything from corns and beans down to the yellow-eyed grass. You can buy a screen for just about anything you need. In uh, this picture is a me mechanized seed cleaner. It's called a small farm two-screen cleaner by a company called A.T. Farrell. This machine was invented in 1850. The company still exists. You can still buy parts for it. This one was built in 1950, as it turns out. And basically, there's seed in the hopper up here. And there are two screens that vibrate back and forth here. And I'll show you a picture on one of our bigger cleaners, what a screen looks like. And the top screen is called scalper. And it basically allows the holes in it are big enough to allow the seed you want to keep to fall through, but any trash or big stuff to be scalped off. And it gets dumped out this side chute right here. It dumps into that bucket. And the second screen is a very fine screen that will let very fine dust and material through, but won't let your seed through. And then the seed will fall down into here, and it's coming up a little conveyor belt. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's seed coming out of the conveyor belt. As this, Normally, I would show a video, but my Wi-Fi is so poor quality that it would freeze up. But this screen has to vibrate at 70 times a minute to work effectively. And so we adjust the machine to, to run exactly at 70 times a minute. There's also a fan we can use, you see here, if we want to blow air through the material to exhaust. And the fine stuff would come out over here in this trough. This is a larger version of that little machine, but this has three screens and two fans. And to give you an idea, this is Dick Bush, who passed away just recently. You take a six foot six tall, was, and same concept. The seed goes in this hopper up above, and it falls down. By the way, this machine was built 110 years ago. It was originally steam powered. You can see the old wheels back here. And it falls down through a current of air. There's an, a fan running back here. And it pulls air in through. And as the seed falls through the air current, it, it sucks off all the light stuff. It falls onto a scalper screen. And that scalper screen does the same thing on the other machine. It knocks off the big stuff and falls out this trough in the front. The seed then fall through to two more screens that are back here on, at a different angle. And they take more and more trash out until the last screen lets your clean seed come out. And it comes out over on this side over here. I have another slide here from the side. You can see the machine on a trailer. And so the seed's going in the hopper, the trash is coming out here, and then these screens are actually taking out the trash on the side. The air machine is pulling the, the dirty material and is dumping it here. It's also exhausting it out here. 
And these other tubes, tubes here come off of other screens to take more trash out. And then the clean seed comes out on the backside where there's a bucket over here. <coughs> this is a top scalper screen. This is on the big machine, but basically the seed falls, and you can see it falling here. It falls onto a flat piece of metal. And this is vibrating back and forth at 70 times a minute. And the seed is in its angle, so the seed moves down over it. And I don't know if you can notice, there's a lot of seed here, but by the time you get here, most of the seed is gone. And in fact, it's all gone here because that screen is allowing the seed to fall through, but the bigger stuff is coming out across the top. <clears throat> this is one of the more current types of seed cleaners, variable frequency air separator seed cleaner. It's a fancy name for a vacuum cleaner, basically. And what you see with the black arrows here is that this is how the airflow moves. So the air is being sucked up through this tube, through this platform, and then out the back into the vacuum cleaner. Now, this machine costs $20,000. It's a lab machine. <laughs> and the reason it's so expensive is mostly this control right here. It's a variable speed drive. So I can control the speed of the airflow very easily, and I can take it to, to basically a whisper, to basically I almost suck up a brick off of concrete because this machine is designed to clean seed from very fine to very heavy seed. So the way this works is you put your seed in the hopper here, and there's a vibrator that vibrates and feeds the seed down into this little trough here, and the airflow is going this way. And the reason it's clear is that you adjust the speed on the fan until this material makes a nice arc. And as what is happening is the heaviest material is gonna fall down here. <coughs> Slightly lighter fraction will fall into this bin, a slightly lighter fraction into the second bin, a slightly lighter fraction into the third, and the lightest parts go back into the back into a tub. And this machine was designed to actually clean seed that's pure. And when you buy, when you have pure seed, some of it will be alive and some will be dead or empty. And so what happens is, is that I can increase the quality of my seed by putting it in this machine and I can let all the good seed fall to the tub here at the bottom, and all the dead seed will be separated out here. The lightest stuff will be in the back, and these others let you adjust and determine where the best separation is. And so with this machine, I can take about 99% of the dead seed out, which means that the seed I'm left with is almost 100% good seed. We've also used this machine in a different way, too. We can clean trash out of seed so long as there is a weight difference between the trash and the seed. And so for like example, Coreopsis leavenworthii, the seed is very light, but a lot of the plant parts that we get off the fabric with it are very heavy. And so what we will do is set the machine up to suck the seed off and put it in the back and to put all the trash in the bucket. You can reverse that process by doing just the opposite. If the seed is very heavy and the trash is light, you can let the seed fall here and take the trash off. So now talking about seed testing. In Florida, if you sell seed, uh, you have to have it tested. We use Halsey Seed Labs, and they're in Georgia. And this is an example of a test result. The one part it's missing is germination because that takes 30 days. But they will do an analysis, and they tell me, for example, this is Aerograssus spectabilis, purple lovegrass, tells me that 96.79% is pure seed. They test the seed with a dye to see how much of it's alive. And they dye it, and if the seed embryo is pink, then it'll it's considered to be alive. And so they tell me that 95% of the seed that's pure seed is alive. What I don't know is how much it will germinate. That takes 30 days. They take 300 seeds. They put them in laboratory conditions, temperature and light. And then at the end of 30 days, actually every 10 days, they count up to 30 days, how many seeds germinated. And that will give me my germination amount. amount. Now, if there's a difference between the germination and the TZ test, that will be called dormant seed because not all plants seed come up 100%. So it's not uncommon in wildflowers for you to find that the seed is 90% uh, dormant and 10% uh, will germinate. That means that dormant seed will come up at some point, but the conditions in the lab were not the right for it. And some examples that we have problems with, for example, beech sunflower, likes to be germinated at 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the lab test is 72 degrees. So a lot of times the lab test you get, because it's a standard seed test that's designed for crops, um, 
unless you specify a specific standard for them. Um, a lot of times the, door, the uh, germination is low for wildflowers because of the lab test that's used to standardize. This test also shows you that there's about 3.11% inert. That means that that is seed that's empty or that it's part of a plant that's just a leaf or a stem or something, maybe some sand that came in. Um, and so in the state of Florida has seed standards. Uh, for example, you have to have at least 90% pure seed. You have to have at least 50% germ. And if you don't have 50% germ, then you have to give the person more seed to make up for that. Uh, we do new production of plants uh, by live material. We've determined over the years that trying to seed directly into the soil does not work because then you have the labor intensive process of trying to figure out what's a weed coming up and what's your seed coming up. For example, this is the Coryopsis leavenworthii that was getting ready for production. Uh, we can do about 20,000 seedlings in our greenhouse. And there's other species here as well, but the Leavenworthia is in the center here. We will plant those out with labor. Sometimes it's free family labor. Um, this is Leavenworthia going out in the test plot. This is Rebecca Herta on the right, standing cypress volunteers here. And this is Elliot's lovegrass coming over here in the production area. And this is the Coryopsis field in bloom uh, in May. We do research as well. And the research plot consists of 100-foot uh, rows, plants on one-foot centers, and 24-foot row, 24 rows, and they're done in multiples. Um, if you come to the farm day this year, you'll see that Hector Perez and Terry Davidson are, Terry's the PhD student, she's studying milkweed, and we have an exclosure now to keep out uh, milkweed butterflies, I mean, no, excuse me, monarch butterflies, uh, that uh, you can't get seed if you let the monarchs eat your plants. So... In our case, we put up screening around it, and Terry is researching uh, um, milkweed production, seed quality work, um, and we'll be getting from Mark Gutz here in another oh, in another day, actually. Uh, we'll be picking up some new transplants from Mark to put into the next root production area. And the reason we do the research is, as I mentioned, there is no book on this. Somebody says, oh, Terry, I'd like you to grow a skullcap for me for seed. Well, I can't go look it up in a book. And so I have to figure out, can I grow it in fabric? Do I need to water it? Do I need to fertilize it? We can feed through the lines or, or through uh, direct fertilization. Um, do I have to water just at the beginning? Uh, do I have to water during bloom season? Uh, typically, we find that we almost never have to water except when we're putting out transplants. If we do get into severe drought, we will water during the bloom period because flowers consume a lot of water, as does seed production. Um, this is the Leatris seedling coming up and some research that was funded by the foundation years ago. And you can see the two of the young little leaves here, and this is the spike of the leaches starting to come up. And we also did research through the foundation on what's the best way to plant mimosa, for example. Uh, this row is seeded with my dogs laying, my former dogs laying on it. <clears throat> these are rows that were grown. The plants were planted alive, but they grew from seed, and these were grown from cuttings. And it turns out, <coughs> excuse me, that the mimosa cuttings do much better because this is a legume and it has a relationship with bacteria in the nodules. And if you use the cuttings, they already have that relationship. And if you use seed, both of those take two to three years to develop that relationship from the uh, bacteria in the soil. And that's the end of my talk. And I think we're ready for questions. Yeah, and so thank you, Terry, so much. Um, it's fascinating. And Terry did yeah. mention Wildflower Farm Day, um, and we this year we're going to um, Terry's farm on Sunday, April 18th, and he um, each year opens his farm to our members and friends, and uh, we usually try to time it when the main field of Coryopsis is in bloom. It's a very popular place to get your picture taken. Um, so uh, look for more of that on our social media feeds. We're going to be opening up registration very soon. Um, but right now, if you have a question, um, please go ahead and enter it into the Q&A um, uh, feature, and we will um, get, them, get them answered. Um, Terry, do all species need to be replanted, or are you able to collect seeds um, from some of the per perennials over multiple years? Uh, good question. So, uh, yes, yeah, some of the species are perennials. So those just come back year after year. Uh, for example, the ironweeds, the, uh, the white indigo, um, 
Coreopsis lanceolata lasts two to three years typically. Uh, blanket flower lasts two to three years typically. Um, but others, uh, once we establish them, they receive themselves pretty well. For example, the Coreopsis leavenworthii, um, we will go in and pull out the dead material because it's an annual. But in the process of doing that, we never get all the seed we collect um, in that process that it'll reseed itself in there. And the seed density is so high that we'll have to do a little hand weeding, but they will reseed themselves really well. Same with Coreopsis lanceolata. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of the other ones that, that reseed themselves pretty well. Uh, mimosas perennial. Love gra all the grasses are perennials, um, but almost all the annuals, uh, like, uh, well, standing cypress, Rebecca mollus, Rebecca herta, they receive themselves really well if you leave some seed out. And we don't harvest the seed right away because we want a little bit to fall on the ground uh, during the time. If you try to harvest everything, we had a grower who actually was uh, harvesting Rebecca herta seed heads before they had a chance to drop, and he basically wiped out his crop because he didn't um, allow any seed to fall on the ground, and so the next year he had nothing come up. Um, and so now has to replant it by hand. But yeah, good question. Okay, um, and in the home landscape, how can Helianthus debilis seeds be treated to provide that 130 degree, degree Fahrenheit um, heat so it can germinate? Typically, if you can put it in a little greenhouse device, or you know, what we find is ours, our, if you leave enough seed on the ground, they will germinate. The soil surface in the sun gets pretty hot in Florida. If you've walked on the beach, you know that. But even even on my soil, if I leave the seed on the surface or in the top layer, and one of the things about seed is our most of our wildflower seeds, you never want to plant deeper than the seed is thick. So that usually means it's going to be in the top one eighth inch, most a quarter inch of the soil, and that gets pretty warm. Um, and so you could do that. But the other way to do it is do it like in a little mini greenhouse. Um, uh, the same is true for sea oats. Um, you can. Initially, to get it germinated, you can just put it in an enclosed container that gets really hot. Um, it doesn't need light to germinate initially. And then once it starts to germinate, pull it out and let it start to go into the light. Uh, for example, Roger Triplett germinates his sea oats by putting them in a semi-trailer, letting them get to 130, 140 degrees. And then once they start to germinate, he pulls them out and puts them in the greenhouse. Hmm. So uh, there's a number of ways to do it. Uh, but as long as you can get that temperature up... Um, and it stays sustained for a few hours, that makes the difference uh, on germinating uh, species like standing cypress, uh, Rebecca mollus, and the, uh, any of the beach flowers uh, are you going to find like that. Okay. Uh, when you're drying seeds with fans, how do you keep them from blowing away? Yeah. Repeat the question. When you're drying seeds uh, with a fan, how do you keep them from blowing away? Um, basically, we don't direct the fan across the seed. We try to move the have the fan going up and down, so it's either blowing air down or off or up into the air and drawing air in over the seed. So, um, and we also our fans are adjustable, variable speed, and so we some seeds you have to have the fan speed fairly low. Some seeds that are heavy and wet initially you can crank the speed all the way up to full speed. Um, but generally, if you don't blow the fan. What I would do is you can solve some of those round fans. You can actually orient them horizontally so it will bring air in over the seed and then blow it up into the air. Um, that's a good way to do a light seed. Okay. Um, for the home grower, can seeds mature if cut from the plant while green? Yes. One of the things that people have a assumption is that, that the seed's not viable unless it's fallen on the ground or fallen out, and that's not true. One of the things you can do to test for this is when the seed, when you look at the uh, seed pod, if you break it open and you find that the seeds are fairly dark um, and you can pop a couple of seeds open and the embryo looks mature, that seed can be picked because what happens in a lot of plants is that the seed stays in the capsule, but the plant shuts off the nutrients and energy to it called abscissing. And basically that lends, lets that seed after. Oh, Terry, Terry, we've lost you again. And Oh, there you are. I, I'm at back. Okay, you're back. Yeah, I had, yeah, I had a incoming call. Sorry about that. Um, the, um, yeah, so the, um, so the seed uh, we find, for example, sunflowers, liatris, um, uh, blanket flower, uh, standing cypress, even uh, Rebecca mollus too. Rebecca heard that. Well, all of them you can pick early, um, and then let that seed dry in the seed head, and then knock it out. Um, and because it'll continue to ever ripen. And, and same is true for mimosa. We'll pick them when they're still slightly green, but mature, 
and just let that pod dry and mature and the seed will uh, continue what they call after ripening. And, and the reason we know that works is because we've had a number of people say, oh, you can't do that. Well, we test our seed. And obviously, if I send it to the lab and it comes back good and it germinates, you can't do it. And so we've, it's one of these things, again, people have told us you can't do that. Well, experience says, you know, you need to try things. And, and in fact, what we find is that lots of these can be picked while they're still green if you need to. Uh, we try not to do that unless there's an, a reason, like on the beach sunflower, because uh, the predators will eat the seed if it falls on the ground. Okay. Um, is your research published about, you know, what you've learned about germinating each um, wildflower species and, and the requirements that it needs? Yes, and if the foundation sponsored it, there was a report issued, and if Lisa, if my memory is correct, I think those are still accessible. Yeah, they're um, on the website. Uh, also, we worked with Jeff Norsini at uh, IFAS, and Jeff has a number of publications about germination. Many of the species I grow, Jeff got me the original seed, for example, the 11 Coryopsis levenworthii, the mimosa, the lancelata, a number of those species Jeff got to us and were done with research that he's done. Also, a number of his students have done research when the foundations helped support some of those. Anne Francis did work on standing cypress and Rebecca Mollis. Uh, as, and Hector Perez's students have done a number of uh, research on a number of different species as well. And all of that is either through IFAS publications and much of that's available through the foundation as well. Okay, um, this is a, a, a multi-question here. Um, how would a potential producer find out whether they can sell specific species? Uh, does the co-op tend to buy seed that's available and are certain species always in high high demand, low supply? Yeah, so the co-op uh, encourages new growers. We are the co-op is a for-profit, but it is, is it's a marketing and um, a purchasing co-op in the sense that we try to buy bulk materials together. For example, one year a lot of people needed fabric, so we got everybody together and bought 12 acres of fabric at a much better price than I could buy if I was buying just a little bit. Um, but we also encourage new growers, and we have species that are in demand. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things the co-op would love right now is to have somebody from South Florida. We had two growers in South Florida who moved on to other jobs and stopped growing for us, and there are a lot of species that are in South Florida only that I can't grow in North Florida because of the freezes here and or because of other conditions. And so, yes, we are, there are species. The best thing to do would be to contact the website manager um, and we have a number of species that uh, we would love to get back on our list uh, from South Florida, uh, and many of those also grow in Central Florida. So um, if you are interested in, it in South Florida, uh, same for North Florida, Panhandle in the clay areas. Um, there are a number of species that only grow in the clay soils up in the Panhandle, and I can't grow those here in our sandy soils. So if there's somebody up there uh, who is interested in growing things, uh, we would love to hear from you. And, and just to clarify, they should contact Curtis Barnes, the business manager. Yeah, he can contact him, and we can he can discuss with you the species that from South Florida. Curtis has has all the lists that we used to grow and what we need, and so he would be the first person to contact. And then, uh, if it's something that it seems to work for both of us, then they would put you in contact with me, and we talk about the best way to try to get it to grow and um, how to get you set up. And usually, we try to get people to start out slowly. Um, with a small area patch and work out the bugs, especially if it's a species you're not used to growing or haven't grown before, because you'd have to figure out some of these vagaries of the, the species. And um, But yeah, so talk to Curtis first. He can tell you which ones we're most interested in. And then if there's ones that you are interested in, then we can work together on getting you started in production. Okay. And does drying seed make them germinate better or are they dried mainly so they will be stable until they're purchased? Uh, drying seed is mostly so they're stable with purchase and also during transport and shipment. Um, it keeps them dormant. Um, the exception is for some wetland species where their seeds do not like to be dried out. They need to stay moist um, and it's hard to do without getting them develop mold and mildew. Uh, Ernst Conservation Seeds is really good at, we don't do wetland species that require them to stay wet and moist because it's very hard to s distribute and sell them and have them be viable. Um, but most species, and even most wetland species, don't need water, they just don't like fire. <laughs> so so um, a lot of the wet species, I have like Latris spicata is a wetland Latris, it does just fine in my upland area, it just doesn't like fire. 
and and so um, you, you can, uh, but most seeds, if you want to store them for a long period in time, need to be dried. Uh, so that makes them stable because they're still alive. They're still respiring. If you want to freeze your seed, you need to drop the moisture to 5% or no more than 10 because you don't want ice crystals forming during the freezing process because that ice crystal will actually damage the embryo of the seed. But you can freeze seed if you get it down in the 5 to 10% range, and that will not hurt the seed. It will drive them into strong dormancy, it's called, but, um, and then you can bring it back out uh, by warming them up and uh, bringing them to more natural conditions. Right. Um, how variable is seed maturity in the stand of a wildflower species? Do you have uh, to do multiple collections of seed from the plants? Um, seed maturity depends on the species. Uh, some Coreopsis mature all essentially at once. Um, for example, white indigo, Baptisia alba, which is primarily in north, north and central, central and north Florida, um, it grows in a pod. It's a bean. Um, Basically, once that pod's mature, you can come along and pick it any time you want. And so it, it comes essentially at, at the end of the system. Um, some species, like Corapsis leavenworthii, they mature over six, eight weeks. Uh, blanket flower produces seed all summer long, uh, as does beech sunflower. Beech sunflower basically will start blooming here and producing seed in May, and it won't stop producing until we get a freeze. Okay. Um, it just depends, just depends on the species. Alrighty. Um, the seeds that uh, are harvested today, can they be replanted today or sh uh, should you wait for a season? Um, if you want to follow Mother Nature, if the seed is ripe and falling out, that's when Mother Nature would naturally plant it. Uh, but what you face then is there are all kinds of predators. There are ants who love seeds. There are mice, small sparrows and birds. Those are primary food source for all those in animals. Um, but if you're looking to be successful in getting your seeds, many, as many of your seeds coming up as possible, you'd like to plant them at the key time. And the rule in Florida, South Florida is a little bit different, is that if you see it blooming, you should have planted it six months before. Um, it's not like up north where I could plant flowers in the spring and they'll come up in a few weeks and bloom it. Um, most everything is um, you see here. So if I have fall wildflowers, I should be planting them in the late winter, early spring. If it's spring flowers, I would be planting them for example, our Coreopsis tend to germinate um, in the fall, early fall, late summer. Um, some species will uh, germinate uh, in the middle of the winter and then do nothing, just sit there and get ready to go until the weather improves. Almost all of our wildflowers that we have are not freeze damaged except for like beech sunflower, and, um, but standing cypress are not bothered, the Coreopsis are not bothered, skull cuts are not bothered, uh, white indigo is does go dormant during the winter. Um, and iron weeds go dormant during the winter, but are perennials and pop back up. Okay. Um, do you have do many of the wildflowers on your farm hybrid hybridize? Um, we have to be careful about that on a couple. Um, the narrow leaf ironweed and the giant ironweed are believed to hybridize, and we've some seen some evidence of that where you see mixed characteristics on some plants. The rule of thumb is if it's a wind pollinated plant, which grasses are then you need to keep those at least a quarter mile apart. And so for, for some of our growers who need pure seed, for example, for nurseries, we separate uh, purple and Elliott's fluff grass by a quarter mile. And I can do that on my farm because it's a quarter mile across, basically. Um, if it's bee pollinated, it's very hard to separate them because, for example, the iron weeds are bee pollinated. And it doesn't matter if I got a quarter mile or a half mile or five miles, I can still get cross pollination. Uh, on this. We also see that in the sunflowers, Helianthus and Gustafolius uh, can cross with other species as well. And that's well documented in the literature. Uh, we have not seen that in the Coreopsis itself though. We have, in fact, Michael Kane at the uh, IFAS did some research on that. We do not see a lot of gene flow across Coreopsis species. Uh, so we haven't seen any hybridization there or, or mixing. But there are some species that do and not, have not seen any Leatris uh, cross either. So it just depends on the genus and the plant species. Uh, we know, for example, on the love grasses, the purple and the elias will, will cross. Uh, so you need to keep them separate. All right. Um, one last question, and I think this is a pretty good one, is um, how do you put the seeds in packets and how long can you store them? 
Okay. We put the seeds in packets. In fact, before I gave this talk, we were sitting here with my business partner putting seeds in packets. And what we do is we get the bulk seed, we get it cleaned and tested, and then we put it into seed packets. And what we try to do is make sure the quantity of seed, the number of seeds, not by weight, but the number of seeds. So most, a lot of places will sell you seed by, uh, by weight. And what we're doing is we've actually done measurements in terms of how many seeds we can give you. And so like on the mimosa, you get somewhere close to 100 seeds, but it's usually a minimum of 500 seeds. Like on bee balm, Rebecca Herta, it may see be several thousand seeds. Um, there are a few wildflowers that produce really large seeds, like some of the lotus. We had a grower who used to grow, uh, who used to harvest lotus, and, um, and about 10 of those seeds would fill a pack, basically, because they're huge. Um, and so uh, we do it by seed count uh, based on – and then use a standard measure that guarantees that we have at least that much – that number of seeds in each packet. And, and then how do you store them? Uh, we store them in conditioned space. If it's large bulk quantities, we keep them, as I mentioned, in a seed condition room that we have that's dedicated to that. It's kept uh, at 75 degrees and 25% relative humidity. Um, and then if it's seed that we're going to be – packaging fairly quickly. We keep it in my house, which is conditioned space, and that's kept pretty much at, uh, in the seed room area at 75 degrees and, and relatively low humidity. And they're stored in not airtight containers, but containers that restrict how much uh, airflow goes through them. Uh, most of the seed in Florida will stay good for five, 10 years. The ones I can say we know for no, are not an exception to that are standing cypress, which will only last for about five years. We bought a bunch of seed from a grower who quit and stored it for a period of time and then found out that it had gone bad on us. Uh, any seed that has a lot of oil in it uh, can go bad, just like any oily product can go rancid, just like your, your cooking oils can go rancid. Um, so a lot of the sunflowers are like that, so we keep them uh, no more than a couple of years typically. And we do that by basically growing just enough to meet demand, and so every year we replenish. So most of our seed is no more than one year old or two years old. And we retest every year. By law, we have to retest. Great. Well, thank you so much, Terry. This has been really very interesting. And again, um, uh, please look for information on um, uh, Wathar Farm Day. Uh, Terry's farm is in Alachua near Gainesville, and uh, that will be on April 18th. So um, if you're interested in seeing all this firsthand, um, you'll have your chance. Um, if you did, if we didn't get to your question, please, again, uh, feel free to email us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will get it to Terry. But just wanted to thank you for joining us today. And we're going to end the presentation now. Thanks a lot.